Hey, this is Carl McKeenan playing Richard on The Walking Dead, and you're listening to The Walking Dead Underground. Now your hosts, Cynic, Igri, and Ryan. And you are listening to The Walking Dead Underground, and I'm your host, Cynic. And joining me, as always, my tag team partner, and the only adult alive to know every single word from Disney's Frozen, by heart, my good friend and yours, Igri. We have a huge show in store for you this week as I sit down and have an exclusive one-on-one interview with the great Carl McKeenan, who played King Ezekiel's right-hand man Richard, and we cover everything from his Bury Me Here story arc to the beautifully tragic Some Guy episode. We also talk about life post-Walking Dead, but if that wasn't enough, we also review the most recent offering, Episode 7, Time for After. Because we are The Walking Dead Underground, the only podcast repeatedly quoted on The Talking Dead. And thank you for that, Chris Hardwick. Like, listen, subscribe. Most importantly, enjoy the show. If you love TV like I do, over the last few decades, you've seen this guy literally everywhere. He's an amazing actor. He's a successful restaurateur. And he killed last season as Richard on The Walking Dead. He's King Ezekiel's right-hand man. Carl McKeenan joins the program. Carl, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Carl, one of my favorite parts of doing these interviews is it lets me look deeper into the performer's career. What does a kid drew you to acting, and what point did you aspire for it to become a career? Well, I mean, I'm originally from New York, and I I don't know, I guess being the third child of four kids, I needed the attention like everybody talks about. But uh, early on in uh, junior high school, I started, you know, I was in chorus, and I started doing the plays. And once I did the plays in junior high school— I never stopped. I did every single play. We used to do three plays a year. So I did three plays a year all through junior high school and high school. It was just something that I really loved. Like I was not a great student as far as like showing up for school and doing a great job and studying, but I never missed a play rehearsal. So I knew there was something there because I I truly, truly loved it. But, you know, coming from Long Island, I I didn't really know how to get into the business. I I had no examples of anybody who could teach me or show me the way. My father was a New York city cop. My mother worked here and there, you know, so we didn't have any relatives or anybody who could really guide me to tell me what to do. So uh, me and my friend, uh, Chris Frangiola, who I went to school with and we did all the plays, who's a comedian. uh, We, we just, you know, decided to go on our own and go to New York city and give it a good, give it a shot. You know, it's kind of the same with us, with the way we started the show. We, we love pop culture. We love discussing it. We had no idea how to do it. And next thing you know, we're buying mics and trying to piece it together and working on editing. And our first show, I could get three words out without stumbling over my tongue. You know, it was, it was just like, ah, 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 ah. I was so embarrassing that I don't even have it up anymore. So a fair number of your roles have you either a cop or a criminal. Did having a family in law enforcement, most notably your dad, prepare you for these type of roles? You know, the funny thing is like my father, you know, I took the New York City cop test. So I was supposed to be a cop. And then um, I went to orientation. And that was like the couple of days before that is when Chris Rangiola came up to my friend and said, hey, I went to this seminar uh, where if we're 20 years old, blue, blue, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes, we should be in uh, Los Angeles. So I went and I uh, went to the orientation and I signed that my grades were good for like five years. And then I had to go home and tell my father that, Hey dad, I, I don't think I'm going to do the cop thing. I'm going to give, you know, acting a shot. And I think that he was a little upset with me, uh, or a lot upset with me because he didn't know what I was going to do. He didn't know how to get into the business, but I think like, I think like seeing my father and then my younger brother became a New York city cop too. I definitely, I definitely got a sense of, uh, like what it, what it, how you carried yourself as a cop. And a lot of my friends on Long Island are cops and firemen. And so I definitely think it helped like being around that family and that environment that would, would help me get those roles or come to them a little easier. Cause really they're just, they're just people like everybody else, you know, and it's just a take on life that they, uh, you dig into as you're acting, uh, one of those parts or roles. The bad guy part, I do get a lot of bad guys, too. I I don't really have any (laughs) I don't know where I get that from. But those are my those are my most fun parts. Yeah, they they always seem to have a little bit more meat to them, right? Because you're able to pretty much do what you want to do. And that was the the interesting part about Richard, because he was a good guy, but he had to do bad things to kind of push his agenda across. So you got a little bit of both with that. I mean, I really loved that character and, and I love the way you play it with such an impressive resume. 
what was some of your personal favorite roles outside of The Walking Dead? Well, I think um, so. I did an episode of Criminal Minds where I played this serial killer who uh, would go kidnap these people who were bad people and then take them on a boat and then uh, beat, abuse, beat them up and drug them to admit that they were bad people. And then he would kill them and pick them apart and sink them to the bottom of the ocean. So it was just this just really like I didn't even know how I was going to get there mentally. I was like, how can I even do this? How can I get into the mind of this person? This person's sick. And uh, somehow, somehow, I don't know where I dug it up from, but it was just really an absolutely fun part to play because you're right. There was no boundaries for me. Nobody could really hold that up against a real serial killer because each one of them are unique. So I just found some uniqueness with inside of myself and other stuff that I thought I could bring to the character. So that was definitely one of the fun parts. Then we filmed it out in the ocean. One of the parts is I get in a fight on the boat and I have to, I get me and the, and the father who I'm, I'm abusing, we go overboard and we go into the ocean and it, it, we filmed that like a half a mile offshore and it was in October and the water was cold and I had to go like 10 feet under the water and then come back up come on the boat trying to get the kid. And it was, it was a challenging, awesome um, role. And, and the stunts were fun too. And it, those are the funnest parts. The, 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 I, I, when you get a part where you just like throwing like context out there, it's, it, it's, it's boring and it's actually harder for me. I do like to have some meat to dig into and to grab onto, to, you know, really get to have fun with the role. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen Mindhunter on Netflix, but uh, it's basically the beginning of the study of serial killers. It's pretty amazing. It's uh, how the FBI learned to profile serial killers. I think it came out just this past year, but really good. If you haven't checked it out, you definitely should. Yeah, I will. I will. I'm always looking for something new. So you get the call. And what's your reaction to be being cast in a recurring, in my opinion, extremely important role on the world's most popular TV show? I mean, I've got to be honest with you. So I, you know, because I have the two restaurants and I'm kind of like a day to day operator, I really am focused on the restaurants and then focused on acting and auditions. But I didn't really have a lot of time. I knew The Walking Dead was out there. I knew it was a, a great show that everybody loved, but I never watched it. I just didn't have the time. So when I got when I went to read for it, I, everybody was like, oh, my God, I love that show. That's the best show. Oh, I hope you get it. And the, 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 they didn't give me real Richard sides. They gave me some fake sides. But it was a really meaty kind of Scott Gimple kind of writing. I could tell that he wrote the audition scene. And uh, when I got it, I was like, oh, this is fun. I'm going to get to dig into this character of this guy who is supposedly um, – trying to take over a bank and kidnapping and stuff like that. That's what the audition scene was. But um, when when I knew I nailed it and when uh, Sherry, the Sherry Thomas, who's the casting director, who's awesome, she actually uh, texted me and gave me a heads up. She's like, because she asked me about riding horses because the character is supposed to ride horses. And I told her I wasn't that great at it. And she she texted me the morning that morning saying, hey, you better get you better start liking horses. And I knew what that meant. So I was really excited. And then I went to the TV and I put on uh, the first episode that I found of Walking Dead and happened to be um, season six, the first uh, episode in the second half of season six. And the saviors came up to the original cast in the band. And it was this motorcycle gang. And this guy comes out, the lead motorcycle savior comes out and starts given this beautiful monologue that's funny and scary and all over the place. I'm like, Oh my God, this guy's an amazing actor. Right. And, and I'm like, then all of a sudden uh, Norman comes out and blows the, all the motorcycle gang up. And this was, this was the opener. And I was like, what? They just killed this great actor. I can't believe it. I was like, Oh my God, I gotta be really good. <laughs> you know? Cause my goal was to never, I didn't want to die. I, Cause I didn't know. So they told me you're going to do five, to eight episodes, maybe more. So I was always in my mind hoping for the maybe more. And uh, I was just like, I'm going to be such a good actor. I want to be so great that they're going to not want to kill me. But as far as The Walking Dead goes, if you're a great actor, they love to kill you because <laughs> that makes more of an impact. Uh, absolutely. And they did it in the most memorable way. You know, if you'd like, I'd like to bring up your restaurant as well. I mean, yeah, great. I think that's amazing. I, I was on the website just the other day and the food looked incredible. I'm going to be in California sometime early next year. I'm definitely going to stop out. Oh, yeah. Please give me a heads up. That would be great. 
I'm having a little get together uh, with some of the Walking Dead people on Sunday because uh, I haven't seen them all in a while. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, that's got to be hard. I mean, it's like any job, right? You you leave and you kind of lose contact with everybody. Yeah, I, I mean, out of all the jobs I've done, I actually keep in touch with everybody. So it's kind of nice. Somewhat, you know, as best I can. <laughs> Yeah, not to sound too much like a fan, but I am a massive Lenny James fan. And uh, I got to meet him, uh, I'd say about last year around this time. And it's the same thing. He was on a show called Jericho, which I I adored when he was on it. And uh, I talked to him about that. And he was actually headed to meet the rest of the cast of Jericho after the convention was done to have a barbecue. So I thought that was great. We could talk about that, too. The exciting news. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's pretty crazy, right? I don't know how they're going to do that. I don't know either. I thought for sure it was going to be cutlets. I, I thought for sure, a hundred percent. A gimple, he's going to find a way. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're pretty inventive over there. What was your opinion on Richard as a person in his whole "Bury Me Here" story arc? I mean, I think like everybody in the apocalypse, you know, I think a lot of what they believed in before the apocalypse was was uh, good, like goodness. Uh, and then you had a change and a lot of your thoughts about killing people and surviving and that stuff all plays into trying to survive. So my, my Richard, I thought, you know, he was, he was a great person, my father person dedicated, but, um, in the, when he lost his family and his wife, um, I think he lost a little bit of his mind. And I think that's where he went, went wrong because his drive to, uh, kill the saviors, was a little it was a little uh it was a little too much it was a little misdriven um and it was only just if he could just tone it down a touch he would have been able to survive the whole thing but unfortunately he was um, richard was just so driven to take out the saviors that he was blind to really appreciate the like the little things that were left in life and the kingdom um i don't know it's tough for me I, i loved his character I loved his drive, but he was a little mis- misguided with uh, how hard he wanted to go through with things. Now, I saw The Talking Dead after you were uh, unfortunately left the show. But as an actor, you're in the car, you're getting ready to go to set, and you're driving there knowing the whole time that you're going to be strangled by one of the most likable guys in the world, Lenny James. What are you thinking going into that day? I mean, I was definitely sad. I mean, I really got, at that time, you know, I, I got to know the cast really well, and I... and and Lenny James, I mean, I just have a man crush on this guy. He's he's such a good person. He's such a great actor. I love that he just sits there and you want to keep the camera on him and just watch him even when he doesn't have dialogue. Because he's he's such a good actor that him listening, you believe you believe he's processing it, he's going through it. So as much as I was sad about leaving the show, I was excited in the fashion that I was leaving the show in the, in the scenes that I got to have with Lenny James in the fact that, you know, I got to play a great scene with a great actor on one of the best shows on television right now. And so as, as much as I was sad, I was, I felt blessed too. So let's speak hypothetically. If Richard was still alive, do you believe the kingdom would have walked into the trap they did? I mean, just wide open and wiped out every capable soldier they had. Um, I would like to think not. I, 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 you know, when you when you watch that episode and you see how confident and cocky that King Ezekiel was, I think I might have grounded him a little bit because I feel like I was I was that for him. I don't know, like if if Jerry is that type of person to King Ezekiel that I was. So I would have think I would have thought I would have had a little bit of a plan more of a plan. I would have maybe did some reconnaissance on it and went and scoped out what we were doing alone because I had no fear about dying. So I would not want anybody in the kingdom to die. So I would make sure that the plan was really thought out and processed. I would like to think that it would have been a little different. But when you have those big guns like that, that you could shoot and just mow down people, I mean, you really don't have a chance. But I I would like to think that it would have been um, probably a little less collateral damage. 
And do you think their first two clean victories led to the slaughter in the third? I mean, they didn't lose a guy. The Saviors ba- barely fired a bullet in the first two fights. And they walk up on this third one and they're like, oh, we got this. Not a one. He keeps smiling. Yet I'm still smiling. And next thing you know, I mean, were you watching at the time? And how do you feel the scene played out? Yeah, I, I, I definitely think that, you know, that's also the way the show likes to do it. It makes you think that, you know, it's going to go one way and then it totally does a 180 on you. Um, I, I thought the way I did love that episode. That's my favorite episode of the season so far. And uh, the way how they they had this, you kind of knew a little bit because the confidence and them having that meeting and you're like, oh, boy, something bad's going to happen. But I didn't think it was going to be that bad. And then they cut to everybody waking up. I mean, not waking up, everybody dead in this devastation. And you even thought King Ezekiel was dead. Yeah, and it was so beautifully shot because they go from that that teamwork huddle. It, you know, everybody is surrounding each other and supporting each other to just that tragic pile on the ground. I mean, that was one of the few times a season that they got it a hundred percent right. That episode from start to go was it was both painful and beautiful to watch. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's thing interesting. So that was the guy. the The guy who edited that scene was Dan Liu, and he is actually the head editor on the show. So um, last season, he was editing a couple of my episodes, and he asked me to do this short film that he wrote because he wanted to give Scott Gimple a show reel because he wanted a directed episode. So we wound up shooting this short film that he, he just did beautifully. It was a really, really good short film. It went into uh, one of the festivals in Hollywood here and it led to him getting the nod to direct an episode. And that was Dan who directed that episode, episode four. Granted the writing and the storyline was amazing too. And Kari was great, but Dan did a beautiful job directing it. I agree the way it was shot. It was just awesome. Last week's episode, I had a little bit of problem with the writing, but the acting was amazing. I mean, Melissa McBride and, and Carrie Payton were just outstanding. I, I, they had me riveted. Kari is so damn good. And I agree. I agree with you on that. And this season, I, I know, like my season, I thought it was interesting because I thought my season moved somewhat slow because they were introducing all these new groups. And then this season, I didn't know what they started off with, like the fighting, fighting. I was like, oh, what's happening here? What's going to happen? And finally, when the Kingdom episode came, Kari and, and uh, Jerry Cooper just killed it. It was so good. It was so good. I uh, really liked that episode. So far, that's got to be my favorite episode. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that if you were still watching. And, and what were your feelings on that? I mean, because that was basically everybody you worked with over there, right? All laying in that pile. Yeah, they wiped out everybody. Except for Diane, who I think is she's at the uh, the hilltop now. Yeah. Apparently. Well, there's some sort of connection with her and one of the heapsters, right? Like they're sisters or something along that lines. Yeah. I don't know what they really thought about that that far ahead, which I don't, I don't think so. I think that was kind of an afterthought for taking it this season because they figured I, I'm curious what's going to happen like to the kingdom. The whole kingdom in general, because that set, that kingdom set is so beautiful and so massive, and they've done so much work on it. I wonder if they're going to still have the, you know, the different uh, locations, or are they all going to combine in one? I don't know. Yeah, in the comic book, I think they kind of tend to, they all collapse basically into one, except I think Sanctuary kind of continues to to maintain. But I think most everybody's in the same spot. So I don't know, but I, I do, I do love the, the, the kingdom setup. I love the way it looks, the way it feels. I mean, and that's what I love about how they introduced all these communities is everything and everybody functions differently. Like they all have a different way of life, you know, where the kingdom looks nothing like the way they do things at Hilltop. And that looks nothing like the way they do things at Alexandria, the leadership structure, the, you know, the commerce, the, you know, the just day to day operations. And the amazing thing about that is, even though you're exactly right, they're so different and different approaches. None of them are working perfectly. Uh, exactly. <laughs> like, you know, well, that's one of my my big uh, questions. Where would you like to live? And undoubtedly, the whole cast is like, oh, we want to live in the kingdom because they just seem to function a little more. Even though there's the huge D&D aspect to it, they seem to function a little more normal than everybody else. You know, if you look at Alexandria, they're constantly in conflict. If you look at uh, Hilltop, they're, you know, they're basically at uh, um, Gregory's beck and call. And, you know, they're all living in small trailers while he lives in a mansion. So it, it, you know. The kingdom was the way to go. It looked like everybody was living pretty well there. I went with it. I believed it. You know, uh, I think that, yeah, the cockiness of them taking the first couple of battles pretty easily 
probably led to them stepping into that booby trap is what I would think it would be. So 2017 was a pretty big year for me. You went from The Walking Dead to multiple Walker Stalker conventions. What was the fans' reaction to Richard? And were there any kind of hard feelings like there were towards Josh, uh, Josh McDermott? I don't think I took it. I don't think they took it that bad. But for sure, people would come up to me and, you know, they were like, you tried to kill Carol. You tried to kill Norma Reedus, you know. And I, I always thought that was funny because I, I would always say to them, I'm like, wait, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, I. I, I would go through their pictures that they would have and I'd be like, wait a minute, here's Jeffrey D. Morgan and he plays Negan and you went up and you paid for his autograph and you probably were so happy to meet him. He wants to kill everybody. <laughs> <laughs> It is kind of how they pick and choose. And I do accuse the fan base of taking it way too seriously sometimes. I mean, I've met Josh. He's a wonderful guy. Uh, you know, he wouldn't hurt, harm a fly. He gets this dialogue, which, you know, they're doing a lot more with Eugene than I ever thought they would. And, you know, now he gets all kinds of flack for basically doing his job. Meanwhile, the lines are out the door to meet the guy that just slaughtered two people with a bat. It, it confuses me so much sometimes. Yeah, I know. I, I love his character that he plays. I love that his cadence of how he speaks. I love the dialogue that they give him. Like he's truly, to me, one of the unique characters on the show that I like because he totally has a different voice than everybody else. I love it. And it's not him, which is great because you would think that you you speak to him and he's just – Talking like, uh, you know, we do, you would think somebody would have to talk like that in real life to be able to replicate that. And it's just yeah, that's not he's, him. He's a comedian, too. You know, that's that's his gig. And same thing with Ross. Well, Ross is kind of an actor comedian, too. But he does those one minute impressions or one 10 second impressions that are great. Oh, he's another one, too, that has really taken the ball and run with. I mean, Aaron, not the most significant character up until, I think, a last, the last few episodes. But he, outside of it, using social media, I mean, uh, his lines were as long as anybody else at Walker Stalker. Now, the first time I saw him, not so much yeah, because they really didn't. They just introduced Aaron and Eric and they hadn't done anything with him yet. And I mean, he's grew his popularity exponentially through social media. I mean, 2017 was a huge year. You went from The Walking Dead to the always popular Twin Peaks. Uh, where are our listeners going to be able to get their uh, Carl McKeon fix next? Uh, I'm actually up for a couple of things right now. I've been offered this kind of horror film where I play this crazy father um, that we're in negotiations with that. Uh, also up for this movie, Bonnie and Clyde movie, and I forget the name of it right now. So I got some things in the work right now, but... Uh, but I'm just waiting for my next gig and I'm excited because, but it's also a challenge to find something as great as I had. When I was finished with that last episode, Bury Me Here, as an actor, I was like, oh my God, how am I ever going to get material like that ever to act? Because it's so hard to get really well-written, character-driven, beautiful scenes like that. So I w that's another reason why I was a little depressed in the way that I feel like, oh, my God, how am I ever going to get great material like this again? So I'm kind of hoping in the future we can, you know, find stuff that is that way. Um, we'll see. Yeah, but that role, you showed complexity. I mean, you showed – you killed in that role. So, I mean, if anything, it should be something to grow from, I hope, that people see that, you know, you're not just the, you know, throw you in a detective suit or, or make you a bad guy, but uh, you really can act. I was amazed at how well you played that part. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That was an extreme amount of fun, and I can't thank Carl enough for taking time out of his busy schedule and stopping by and talking to us. If you weren't a fan of that guy after this, you might be doing something wrong. Keep up with his remarkable career at carlmckeenan.com. There you'll be able to find him on all his socials. He's extremely active, and he's a fun follow. He'll also make you hungry. And if you're a foodie like I am, and you are in the greater Los Angeles area, look for his fantastic restaurants at thelocalpeasant.com. Look over the menu, find the location, go there and eat, and then tell them The Walking Dead Underground sent you. It won't get you anything, and they probably won't know what you're talking about. It's just a badass supportive thing to say. All right, so for today, we're missing dear Ryan. Um, he's off starting his trans, which we both support. We're going to start the episode off. It's episode seven of season eight, the time for after. Based off the title alone, IG, could this be anything but heapster gibberish? Oh, it was totally heapster gibberish, you know, and I don't know. They're growing on me somehow. I don't know why Jadis is growing on me. I, I Just maybe her confidence or something is just working because whatever she does, she's so certain about. 
and it just it works on some level. The language still drives me a little crazy, but it works. Yeah, sometimes I w- I want to take a deeper look at what they're doing over there, and then the rest of the time I just slap myself with a frying pan and say, "What are you thinking?" Because you know by minute five of the episode, you're going to be searching to see what else is on TV. I can only imagine what it must have smelled like in that shipping container that poor Rick's sitting in. I mean, imagine Andy gets the, he gets the script and he's looking at it and he's like, all right, I'm in a shipping container in the middle of August in my drawers. You know, and it looks like he's been there for a while. It probably smelled like two hobos humping in there. You know, I mean, even if it, the set isn't actually a dump, I mean, they've made it look like a dump. So it probably smells pretty rank. And, you know, the, the dialogue just drives me crazy. I mean, I, I can get in with the, the Blade Runner get up, but, but the, the, it's the dialogue amongst them. But after a while, it would be just like, you know, we're only two or three years into this. Knock it off. I mean, you haven't forgotten how to speak. It hasn't been it hasn't been hundreds of years and they came across uh, like an English textbook and they just took excerpts of what they thought worked to make it more sheep or hip or cool. I don't know. What do you think Jada's did before all this? What do you think she did for a living before the apocalypse? Um, well, she may very well have been some sort of artist. Uh, that's where I think she came from. Um, probably very solitary. Um, more concerned with her art than anything else, including being around people. I don't know how that qualified her to lead a bunch of people, unless they're an artist collective or something, but they seem a little aggressive to do that. So I don't know where the rest of them came from, but that's my guess would be, you know, she's, she's really into her art. So that would, that would tend to lead. She was some form of artist. And I would think like, you know, we've all seen some news stories of these crazy artists like that chick a couple of weeks ago who sat naked in front of the Mona Lisa showing everyone her hoo-ha. That, that she'd be one of those kind of artists, but someone with a, some actual other skill as well, because we saw the cat that she made was making currently and the one that Rick stole like last season. Yeah, I, the sculptures were actually very good. I have two schools of thought here. I think a lot of them probably were either mall employees or they all worked at Starbucks together and they probably annoyed all their friends trying to convince them that Lana Del Rey is a talent. And they had those intentionally ugly dogs and all drove around in a just a big uh, heap of Vespas, you know, just a big gang of uh, Vespa riding artists drinking Starbucks, listening to Lana Del Rey. Or single Staying gear up. bicycles. Single gear bicycles would have worked on most of it. <laughs> With the giant wheels. <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, either the old, really old ones with the big giant wheels, or just like just the the hipster bike with a basket on the front, and just. Mm-hmm. And Rick hits them as soon as the door is open with, "Well, you know, it's not too late for you. My offer still stands. You can join us or die." You know, nothing like dealing with a, from a position of power, right? I mean, you're in your drawers, your hands are tied, <laughs> you're sweaty, <laughs> and he's like, "Hey, listen, this is the last chance. I'm serious this time." <laughs> Why do you think they won't agree with Rick? I mean, are the, is she intentionally being difficult or is this her way of flirting? I mean, would it hurt maybe if Rick went a little pro quo and maybe just laid with her once to get this going? How long are we going to have to hang out in the junkyard before they say yes? The sexual tension is palpable. It's just going crazy. Well, not really, but, you know, she likes to believe it is. I It just does not look like he has any legs to stand on. You show up by yourself saying, join us or die. It I could see the garbage pail kids looking at this like, this dude has got to be loony. Are you, we just double crossed you. We, we heard a whole bunch of you. And now you're standing here saying, all right, let's do this again. I could see where they would take a moment of thought, and I just I'm still not fully on board with Rick going back there. I know they need bodies, but come on. I mean, go get the chicks out at the oceanside place. Just start there. Yeah, you do have at least a few able bodied people there. I I'm surprised. I mean, we're going into the last episode of the season and we've yet to revisit that whole uh, area out there and what they're doing and what might be going on with them. And that worries me a little bit that something bad may have happened over there or is going to happen and they're, they're going to kind of come find the remnants of it. And then, you know, that's yet another thing that the good guys have stacked on their mantle is the fact that they took these guns and something bad happened to Oceanside. And it's like, you know, do we ever get a moment's rest where – uh at all this season, are we going to get any kind of win? In, in, not a, not a. We're going to drive up 
and, and ambush people having a picnic win, but a, a win where we feel good about this last seven or eight episodes where people walk away and like, OK, uh, you know, I'm going to come back for uh, roll B just in, in a couple months and see, you know, that there's progress and that uh, we're, we're close to the next thing. And, uh, you know, I. I really think they're they're doing a little bit of stretching and it, it worries me a little bit because there's a lot of different ways you can go with this. There's a lot of content out there. Instead, we're we're kind of getting an episode where, all right, well, more Eugene, because that's exactly what everybody was asking for. And I get that too, IG. I mean, this this trip was necessary, right? But I mean, she wants to sculpt them after. It's getting a little weird. I mean, how necessary would you have made this field trip if you were Rick? Where I mean, how many times would you be kicking yourself in that shipping container while you're sitting there just kind of waiting for them to come to their senses and join the team? I don't know. That that place like seems kind of like Detroit to me. Like you go there once and you never go there again. You just you, you've seen it. You know what it smells like, and you decide. All right, I've had my fill of it. It's good. I'm glad I went once. I'm not going back. So no, if I was Rick, I'm not going back there. If I happen to encounter them on the road, I might throw a, a finger sign up at them or something and say, "Hey, what's up? Do uh, you guys want to come our way still? Because I'm not coming to your house. You guys are hoarders." So it, it, that's really what it looks like. Is that he's really grasping at straws? And I don't. If if everybody sticks to the plan, they may, they shouldn't even need these guys really, if they stick to the plan. And that's the problem in this episode is they decide not to. Yeah. It seems like Rick's plan was the only one that made sense. And the one least likely to be followed by anybody ever. So further your point about Detroit or the whole state of Michigan, really, it's one of those odd States where we never get any listens from. I'm not sure if anybody still lives out there. I know I did fly in there once I had a set bun. I saw, you know, Tiger Stadium as I flew by, saw the Great Lake. I, I think I've had enough of Detroit. I don't think I ever want to go to Hardcore Pawn. I don't, you know, <laughs> there's nothing in Detroit drawing me there. If they were giving away Red Wings tickets, I don't think I would go. I just uh, sell it to Canada already and be done with it. You know, I think Michigan <laughs> is an antiquated idea. I think uh, they can just have it back. It'll be fine. So Eugene goes to Dwight and orders the, to, for him to cease and desist all betrayals and backstabbery. That's a great word, backstabbery. Why do you think Eugene is trying to protect Dwight? I mean, if it was anyone else in Negan's inner circle pulling the backstabbery, as he put it, do you think he'd already gone to him and blew the whistle? No. Actually, I think he's just looking to keep his spot secure. And he knows things, and when he finds things out, he just tries to keep everything status quo. And that's really all I think this is about. I think it's about the status quo. Keep it all on the up and up, keep it all level so that everybody gets to keep doing things and he keeps getting to play Galaga and eat his pickles. That's all he wants. And and he sees Dwight messing with that and he's like, all right, man, like quit it or I'm gonna have to tell somebody. I'm gonna go tell daddy unless you stop. And it just, it's just the fear in Eugene. And I think the only thing keeping Eugene as quote unquote Negan is fear. It's not that he really wants to be there, but he's safe and he gets pickles. I mean, who wouldn't trade their whole life for safety and pickles? You know, I thought a lot about that. And I may go back to these in the questions that I wrote. But I thought a lot about that, too, is like, you know, there's a inner struggle with him between fear and intelligence. I personally think that it's more like, all right, well, I'm going to gather this information. And information is interesting because you have it. And sometimes it's not what you know, but when you reveal it is important. You know, you, you want to wait for that big aha moment. You don't want to just, uh, you know, I don't want to run in half cocked and give you half the story at the wrong time. But when you reveal stuff, it's as much about timing as it is about the content of what, you know, you know, if, uh, you're already on the ropes, it's kind of like waiting to throw that perfect combination that might not have put you down at the beginning of the fight, but at the end of the fight, it's going to take you to the mat. And sometimes I think that Eugene's like, all right, I got this, I got that. And it's just more of a question of waiting, but you're playing a really dangerous game when it comes to Dwight. I mean, we saw him have a innocent man basically tossed in a furnace because he was covering his own hide. You know, meanwhile, you've got this guy that he really doesn't have any loyalty to, uh, loy uh, he really doesn't have any loyalty to and no reason to help or save, but he just keeps giving them all these chances. And I, I think there has to be something deeper there. I mean, because if you look in the the episode, 
he's talking about his friends and he keeps referring to them as traveling companions. Now, that's trying to distance yourself from it. You know, we've been we've been friends for 12 years, 13 years now. We've been podcast partners for over a year now. Uh, you know, but then when if I start calling you an acquaintance, you know, that's really boiling it down <laughs> to the most simplistic level. It's more like, I don't really know Ig. I don't, you know, he's just some guy that I would have conversations with on the internet. You know, you'd have to do something pretty awful for me to do that to you. And Rick and Rosita and Abe and Glenn and none of these people ever did they never did Eugene wrong in any way. They just, you know, they, if anything, they 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 loved and they supported him and they kept him alive. Other than Abe throwing that savage beaten out by the fire truck uh, when once the, <laughs> <laughs> Eugene uh, revealed all the backstabbery. But we can't hold that against anybody because Abe is dead now. I mean, really, I mean, he got his comeuppance. If that's the way Eugene is running on this, Abe Abe is dead. So everybody else has all been people that have gone literally out of their way to keep Eugene safe and fed and happy. You, you know, so you're absolutely right in that he's he's throwing this these people under the bus for no real reason other than to keep his spot secure and trying to get everyone to believe that there's no allegiance and and I don't know if it's a game and I I pray it does. I mean, our tweet on the Talking Dead last night is absolutely true. I love me some haircut. It's he's such a great great character he's so much fun it's funny though because we obviously have this this error about dwight that he's a tough guy you know he was a, you know a biker obviously he you know maybe a little bit of a rough and tumble pass that's what at least how they play him and then you walk eugene in armed with information and an, a magnificent mullet were you surprised that dwight didn't throw him at a whole sale ass beating the second that he uh, just started on his tirade against him like you better stop this i know this but I'll, I'll i'll let you go as long as you agree to stop right now well i think the problem lies the other way too because i think dwight wants to maintain his position because it gives him intel about what's going on intel that he can pass on to rick and the gang and so if he throws a beating to to eugene People are going to go, where'd this beating come from? Who beat the shit out of Eugene? And it's going to narrow down rather quickly. And so I think if he does that, that ends badly. So it really works out well that he doesn't beat him and he just scares him a little bit. Well, you know, it might have been that I was tired. It might have been that I was a little bit giddy at work. It might have been. But when I watched this episode, the only thing I could think of was when Pee Wee Herman stumbled into the bar, uh, biker bar and Pee Wee's Big Adventure. And he's like, I'm trying to use the phone. And he promptly walks out and knocks over all their bikes. And they just they, you know, they're chasing them and want to beat them relentlessly. Well, that could have worked, too. But, you know, the problem is Negan. The problem is the other lieutenants. You you, you beat them relentlessly and somebody's going to find out. And then they're going to be like, why are you beating Eugene? He's got a job here. You have a job here. You can't just beat up Eugene and then things are going to come out. Yeah, I agree. If you do it, you got to work the body. You know, you, know, you, you got to be abusive husband, Alabama style. You can't leave any marks. Dwight lays a very rational argument at Eugene's feet. Basically, IG, all you have to do is nothing and your friends win. Now, we've spoken repeatedly about secret agent haircut, but as this episode wore on, do you think it's starting to become less or less likely, or does he not want to reveal his hand because he just doesn't trust Dwight? Well, I don't know as he's been a secret agent completely all this time. I think he has been doing some things to benefit the sanctuary, but it's still knowledge is power. I think I still think that time is going to come. I'm holding out hope because, again, Eugene is such a great character, and he did so much for Rick's group and everybody else on the good side, quote unquote, before this, that we would love to get him back. And I think the time is coming, and his amount of knowledge is going to help that. So I I don't think he's been a secret agent, but he's been so deep into everything that he's going to be able to go ahead and turn back to the other side with very, very intricate knowledge of the inner workings of the sanctuary. That's going to turn everything because even if the sanctuary moves, if they leave that building and go somewhere else, he knows about how everything works. And that's where this lies. If you know how it works, you can break it. And that's what's going to happen. And Dwight is getting them in the door, but I think it's going to be, I, I, Hope it's going to be Eugene that gets them the the eventual W, the win, as it were. 
I think in the very end, there's going to be a lever to push, a button to hit, and Eugene ultimately is going to do the right thing. Right now, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, it would have to be in the most opportune way, and it would have to be almost like, yeah, I was on your team the whole time. Yeah, you know, it's almost like he's picking, or waiting to pick a side. I'm gonna stay as neutral as I can. I'll, I'll play like I'm on both teams, but I'm gonna, I'll help Sasha. But then I'll jump back and I'll, you know, agree to fill up ammo casings, and then I'll jump back and do this. I, you know, it's almost like he's just waiting to pick sides. But the stress level has to be high. I mean, we we actually saw him break. Great quote from Dwight. He said, basically told him, "You don't have blood on your hands, not yet." But once you do those things, you become those things. And that really set a tone of actually how haunted Dwight is because the doctor's got to be on his conscience. You know, that guy that he caught and walked back to sanctuary and killed before he got back there so he could stick him on the the fence has got to be in a, you know, and probably uh, people like Denise. There's uh, probably a laundry list of things that Dwight has done that he feels guilty for, you know, and Sherry reminded him of that. Like, I've got to go. So you stop remembering who you are so you can keep this going. What did you feel about that scene? I mean, I really thought it was a great bit of acting from Austin Emilio and Josh McDermott. And I don't consider these guys like marquee guys on the show. And yet they kind of stole the show last night as far as, you know, they centered it around them and they became really important. Well, and it showed that they can center around these guys and not really put out a bad show. I mean, there were problems with it, but there's problems with I mean, even the best episodes of The Walking Dead, I can find little things that bother me. But that's pretty much anything out there because I'm I'm old and I'm a cynic and something just has to be wrong with everything. Nothing can Flippity be perfect, flew. which is awful. <laughs> Flippity flu. And but the the acting was strong. The dialogue was on point. And I know that's not all of them, but they, you, you still got to be able to act it to to get what's off the page into the into the show. And they were amazing. And I they showed that they can move away from the central cast and get to these people and focus on them for an entire episode. And it's still intriguing and fun to watch. And it it worked. They knocked it out of the park. Austin Emilio and Josh McDermott are stars, man. They, they did a great job in this episode. I really did love their interactions and how they did. And things. that's what's killed me because the dialogue between even the most minuscule characters, not to minimize what they do, but the dialogue between those minuscule characters has been really, really good. I just wish they'd take some of that effort and push it towards the plot. So what we're watching makes a little more sense and it makes it a little more enjoyable. I mean, is Dwight right? I mean, you you screw around in Sanctuary long enough, you hang out long enough. It isn't long before your face looks like half a burnt grilled cheese sandwich. Or does Eugene fancy himself too smart for the iron? Like, I can do this. I can navigate these waters. I I can not get caught. I'm not going to end up like you, Dwight. Well, that's the thing. You know, if if you're dealing with a boss, quote unquote, like like Negan, you're going to mess up at some point and he's going to you know, lay the smack down on you, be it an iron or some other form of punishment. Nobody is past it. Like nobody. The only person that won't get that kind of punishment is Negan himself. So uh, you're, you're tempting fate. And I, I think that he thinks he can get by with it and shift blame or do whatever. But, you know, I mean, as Negan was saying, when this whole debacle started, I'm going to give you this much time to get it done. And if not, I'll put you down myself, but it'll be quick. That's my favorite of you. So either way, I got your back. And it's just one of those things where Negan is saying, I'm going to you either win or you're done. And even if he wins, if he has other losses or other problems in, in the process, he may get the iron or some other form of awful torture to remind him who's in charge. And I don't know that Eugene really understands the depth of the problem that he's in. And that's where, you know, I think it may actually take something like Negan hurting Eugene to make him swap. And I think it's coming. Uh, That might be something that comes. Once again, we get a really, really odd coincidence because we watch Fear the Walking Dead And those characters are constantly covered in slime. We've watched from season one where they've used the guts trick over and over again, all the way up to when they were trying to sneak out of Alexander when they were overrun. But the first time somebody brings up the fact that, hey, maybe 
covering ourselves with the entrails of the dead could, could possibly lead to some side effects. Father Gabriel comes down with some explained, uh, unexplained ailment, which has to be which kill, uh, the same one that killed Padme during childbirth. All he seems to care about is the fact that we need to, sm- uh, we need to smuggle Dr. Carson's 2.0 back to Hilltop. Do you think the good father's days are numbered? I, I have no doubt. He's not going to pull through this. Um, it, especially because now the good Dr. 2.0 is looking for Eastern oh. medicine to try and put some herbs and spices on him. He's, he's going to try and turn him into a Kentucky fried chicken. I just, <laughs> I just don't see Father Gabriel making it through this. Uh, it would have to be some weird <laughs> act of God for the good father to get him and through this. No taking shots at the holistic types that, uh, you know, believe in this stuff, but I don't, I'd love to see the percentage chances of how many times rubbing dirt and leaves on something works, you know, how many times the Eastern route works. I'm, I'm sure it has. I'm sure that because if not, people wouldn't be doing it, right? Because everybody would die. So that has to have some percentage chance of working. But I would love to see what it is. You know, you take that and line it up with you know, actual medicine, you know, from science. And then you go to a hut and you you do some other stuff with some holy water. And I would like to see the percentage chances of each thing and how often or worked for each ailment, because I don't like Eastern medicine's chances against at least, you know, up against things like cancer or, 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 you know, something far worse where an organ needs to be removed. And, you know, just drink some sage and hop on one foot and, you know, everything will be good by tomorrow. Yeah, well, you know, they could get out the doll and do the funny dance and it'd be just as effective. You know, we get a voodoo doctor out here. Maybe he can make something happen. Problem is, is this is a massive infection that is shutting down organs. This calls for huge, huge, huge amounts of antibiotics that they don't have. Funny thing is, I don't know why they don't have some of these things because there are stockpiles across the United States. And, and somehow all they tend to get is a couple of bottles of ibuprofen and and you know, one or two inhalers. That's all they've got. It just does not count. I mean, you get, you had to have broken through some hospitals at this point. Gabe tries to reason with Eugene about doing the right thing. And Eugene really has a lot of good logic here because sometimes when you do the right thing, I'll do the right thing for me. But then on your front side of the fence, things go terribly wrong. Is he too far gone? Is this cowardice speaking? Or do you think it's intelligence? I mean, he's making the intelligent play because that's going to be the debate today amongst people standing at the water cooler or over this week. Is he a coward or is he a genius? Well, that's the thing is, I mean, there are still a large amount of people there at Sanctuary. And if he makes this decision that the father wants him to make, if he makes this decision, how many of those people die? So really, in the grand scheme of things, you know, maybe it's a moral dilemma inside Eugene. He was taken there. There's thousands of people hanging out at the sanctuary. You make a decision to try and turn it over and half of them die. Well, that's blood on your hands, right, Eugene? That's that's something that you did wrong because you turned these people into into just dirt because, you know, you believed in Rick. Well, there can't it be both ways. Can't you find a way? Or can't somebody find a way that both get to exist and, you know, maybe one or two on each side die? And maybe that's what Eugene is looking for. I'm hoping that, I mean, he does appear to me as a genius as far as some of this concerns, because you're right. You make the decision, make the right decision. The right decision for Rick's group is an absolute wrong decision for the saviors. And you got to remember, not all of these saviors are bad people. Just because they're following Negan, some of it's got to be circumstance. Look, they, everybody wants to live. Even in an apocalypse, everybody's going to want to live, and you're going to do what it takes to live. And if it takes listening to a crazy person that will put an iron to your face just because you disagreed with them or made a double jump in checkers, guess what? That's what you do. Don't double jump anymore. Don't make bad decisions. Do what you're told. And they're making their decision to keep themselves alive, and it's working. So if you throw that whole thing under the bus and a whole bunch of people die, how bad are you going to feel? So I go genius route on this, honestly. Okay, so we jump back outside to the gang that can't listen straight. Daryl and Tara and the whole group of them decide that they hit the reactor with the dump truck of doom and the whole system goes down. Just like that. Just the way I said it, IG, the whole system goes down. But wait, (laughs) how do you feel about this plan? And was that Rose freaking Zeta, who was the voice of reason? I mean, 
are we an upside down world? WTF? How, you know, for, for a season and a half now, she's gone rogue and has been pissed off and been the voice of, you know, disillusion and, and anger. And I'm going to go, I'm going to act out. But suddenly she's like, Hey guys, maybe we should, you know, finish our vegetables, drink our milk and be in bed by nine. Did, what do you feel about the plan? And were you surprised it was her to break for the, the, the group and just say, eh, I don't think this is such a great idea. Well, anytime the plan is working, the original plan and the original plan is working very well. Anytime that's happening and you decide midstream, all right, let's change. That's a bad idea. Let the plan come through. Secondly, if Rosita is double guessing your change to the plan, maybe you should too, because Rosita's balls out most of the time. She'll go after any crazy thing that might get her a little bit of comeuppance. And guess what? You know, if she's like, uh, this isn't the good plan, guys. Yeah, it's probably really bad. And that's why I don't get why they aren't listening. I mean, it's got to be one of the most awful decisions in the history of time. If Rosita's going, um, we probably shouldn't do that. And I don't I don't expect them to, to just listen to everything Rosita says, but she's just second guessing somebody else's idea when she's normally full on board with, yeah, let's kill a bunch of saviors or let's go and blow up some shit. And that's great when it's there and it's somebody else's idea. When Rosita's coming up with her own ideas, that's when things fail. She's not this is not her idea. She's saying bad, bad, bad things. And since when, and I, this is the first time that she's really been extremely relevant to saying that, you know, let's, let's second look at this. And, you know, I, I really commend her job in this because the actress did a wonderful job. She, she portrayed it very genuinely and I believed it. And it didn't seem like she was just standing there like, no, guys, don't do it. She it, she expressed that, you know, this is bad and this could end very badly. And it, you know, I'm I'm thinking that, like, like I said, if you, if you swap in the middle of a plan that's working, you're looking nothing more than to just blow up the original plan to begin with. Well, they've hedged their bets and they've got the whole one side of Monopoly where boardwalk and park places, they've built their hotels. And for about the third or four pa- uh, third or fourth pass around the board, you somehow get out of there without having to pay any rent to them. And you hit go and you keep going and you're laughing at them. And what essentially Daryl is doing is he, he's like, all right, enough of this. And he just kicks the board over and he's leaving. I, I mean, I'm going to put you in that situation. IG, you see sanctuary. It's surrounded by walkers, like at least 20 deep on all sides. Is the smart money play here to wait it out and hopefully nobody interferes and and gets everybody out of sanctuary? Or do you drive the dump truck of doom through the doors and do quick and dirty? Well, that's the thing is, I mean, they not only have this 20 deep line of walkers around the whole place, but they've got snipers ensuring that they can't really do anything about it. So if they try and come out, people are going to shoot them. You've got this place locked down. Why would you mess with that? You, you're they're, they're running low on water. The power is off. They don't have much food. They can't get out to get anything. They are going to win if they leave it the fuck alone. And why can't people can't just leave well enough alone, especially when it I mean, that's a the Daryl problem kind of all the time. Something's going on and Daryl thinks he has to stick his face in it. I mean, honestly, that's why Glenn is dead. Is it completely his fault? Did he know how bad it was going to get? No. But if he would just sat there and shut the fuck up, Glenn would be alive. Well, I know. And, and we go back to that. And that bothers me a little bit because he's already beaten one person to death right in front of you. And yet you still have to jump up and swing to show how big your balls are. You know, I understand that he was kind of taunting Rosita and Maggie. And, you know, I I understand that he was sticking up for the little guy. But this guy means business. You know, what did he think? He had a quota of one and he was just going to stop that day. You know, uh, that that bothered me a little bit, that that whole scenario. Like, and I'm not questioning uh, Daryl Dixon's level of education because I don't know. We don't have enough background on that that front. But he's obviously not leader material because he's never shown that. Like he's never shown any kind of uh, depth to, to be leader. So this plan was designed by smarter people than him, or at least we could assume. And say this this move works. Great, you win. It's, it's a big gold star on his, uh, his winged vest once he gets it back. But if you lose, I mean, outside of fighting Rick last week, you've also cost probably hundreds more people to die and – where does that leave him and Rick in the grand scheme of things? 
Well, I mean, I think it's going to that's going to lead badly. But I mean, Rick being the good guy he is is still going to love and trust probably Daryl. I'm I'm guessing. Problem is, is like I'm guessing to make all this happen. Literally, probably about a hundred people were involved in formulating a plan to get the sanctuary under siege, like it is. And three people decided they don't like that plan. Well, that's not how this is supposed to work, guys. Hundred people put this plan together and it's working and three of you go decide nope we're gonna do our own thing well you may not get to keep your motorcycle maybe maybe rick takes that away from him or something and grounds him and says you've been a naughty boy or he doesn't get the extra side of beans with his dinner tonight i don't know what it's gonna be but it's gonna it's gonna cause a little bit of second guessing between the two of them i think i'm i'm, I'm hoping that things still work out but you know Daryl is going to have to see the error of his ways at some point. And I think it's going to come in our mid-season finale next week because it looks like some shit is about to go down. Negan brings Eugene in for a go team kind of talk because it seems like at this point, Eugene is the only person that Negan can rely on. He also compliments him and gives him a handshake out of respect. And then made me wonder a little bit, is this not only about safety for Eugene, but about respect as well? I mean, if they would have gave him maybe a, little bit more of that at Alexandria, if they would have put a little faith in him, if they would have put, uh, you know, if they would have gave him some sort of position of esteem, would we be in this situation now? I, I That that confuses me a little bit because he basically walked in there as a captive and, you know, a week later, he's about number three on the pecking order. So do you think it was it's as much about safety for him as it is the respect he's been shown by Negan? Absolutely. Um, and that's the thing. If you're made to feel valuable, you're going to be a little more loyal, right? You know, you got to really, you got to feel good about what you're doing. And that's, Negan is good at that. He'll make you feel good if he wants to. And like you said in earlier episodes, he's like, he takes your weakness and turns it into strength. And he sees the weaknesses that he, he second guesses himself a lot, Eugene does, and that he's timid and everything, and he uses that to to push him forward and teach him how to take control of the situation and do what he's supposed to do sometimes. Because obviously Negan doesn't want to be pushed at directly, but that doesn't mean that he's unwilling to take advice from somebody who might know something. You know, Negan's a a fairly good leader when he's not beating people with bats. He just has the necessity to hurt people at sometimes too, which is the problem. Yeah, that seems to be the last line. It's like, all right, I'll compliment you. I'll motivate you. And then there's always the threat of violence if things don't work out. Going back to Daryl a little bit. And I, I wish I could talk to Norman Reedus about this and see how he feels about it. I mean, Rick has already explained that uh, repercussions of everything he's about to do. Like if you do this, you could force them all against this, which we're trying to divide and conquer here. You know, we'll, we'll get the common folk rised up and th they'll take care of the savior problem inside and we should be all right. But this dump truck move, you're just putting hundreds and hundreds of people's life at risk to get it done quicker. Do you think that's slightly out of character, slightly more dark side and sorry for all the Star Wars references, but slightly more dark side than we've ever seen out of Daryl Dixon? It's getting there. It's getting right around the corner of pretty goddamn dark because it's I don't know where he thinks he needs to be the savior of the zombie apocalypse, because that's exactly what he's doing is he's showing that like I can win this all by myself, except you're one guy. And there's a lot of saviors. And even if you kill hundreds of them, they're going to get out now because you let them out. And then what's going to happen next? Because obviously they have firearms, they have vehicles. They have know-how. If you don't kill, if you don't take the head off of the snake, the snake is going to bite you. And that's the thing is, you know, Negan is going to throw everybody out in front of him. So likelihood, if you do this, Negan lives. It's it's a problem all the way around. So Dr. Smarty Pants comes up with what I can only describe as the iPod 11. Somewhere on his grave, Steve Jobs is turning over because he's figured out a flying iPod with zombie repellent Lana Del Rey music playing and a slightly improved camera. How long before Apple brings this to market and how long before Samsung rips it off and brings the exact replica out or vice versa? Oh, I think it's going to be a feature on next year's iPhone. I think it's going to have wings that expand out of it and you can fly it around to pull people away from you. That's absolutely going to be a, that's what the people are going to demand it. We're going to have to have flying iPhones. 
This not, I mean, everybody, look, people are buying drones and everything now. Why not just add them to your phone? Wouldn't that be great, though, if you left your phone somewhere and it just flew back to your hand, sort of like Thor's hammer? Like every time you put your phone down, you just held your hand out and your iPhone popped back up. So no matter where you left it, you know, it just flies through everything to reach to. Chances are it'll have a broken screen when it gets there because, you know, Apple needs that $150 to repair it. But it would still be cool to have your phone just show back up wherever you are. Whether it had to fly or aren't we all going to get that chip implanted right in the center of the palm of our hands now so that it knows where home is, you know, I, something's going to happen. I mean, it's the people want it. L- listen, Apple, <laughs> we we want flying iPhones with zombie repellent, <laughs> with zombie repellent built in. You can even like tap in to the whole DC franchise if you want and name it Bat Zombie Repellent. And then you could get some money from DC and line your stuff up into the next Justice League movie. You'd be set, right? You can get some of it paid for that way. Well, don't forget the mildly improved camera because that'll sell it tons. You've got to always improve the camera just slightly for idiots like me to stand in line and pay thousands of dollars. And you could even like say it's slightly improved and not improve it at all. That's all you have to do. You have to say it's slightly improved. Just give me a camera that can take low light pictures. I'd be happy. Eugene gets caught with his hands down his drone and Dwight threatens to shoot him. Haircut quickly apologizes for any injury he made a cause by chomping down on Dwight's chode. Was it straight up balls from Eugene to launch the drone anyway, even though Dwight's standing behind him with a, uh, yeah, basically a gun to his head and should have Dwight shot him when he went ahead and launched it. It was pretty ballsy, but I think, you know, the the flip side from earlier is true that, look, you can't beat up Dwight, you can't kill Eugene, you can't do any of these things because then somebody's going to get found out. You you know, so he knows that, like, if you shoot me, Dwight, Negan's going to find out that you've been passing all this information because he's going to be like, why'd you shoot him? He's out there trying to figure out how to get us out of this. That's the task I gave him. You know, there's no explanation Dwight could come up with to clear himself of killing Eugene. And somebody's going to see it. Somebody's going to know. They might not have heard the conversation, but they're going to have seen him kill Eugene. And that's a problem. Uh, I still like the balls out of Eugene, though, because he's like, you know what? Um, You're going to just have to do what you got to do. But I'm launching this thing because I'm going to save us all. It, It was pretty ballsy. I did enjoy it. Yeah, it really was. And I I wanted to see it work even just a little bit. Even if one walker just kind of followed it down the road, it would have made my day. You know, if they would have used a kite with a key on it and and electrocuted the walkers, anything, I just wanted to see something change about the situation. And I guess it did in, in, in not a way that's, you know, proactive to the heroes. After the walker storm sanctuary, we see a little bit of evil mullet action as he goes in and explodes all over uh, well, all over Gabe and drops a great D&D line. He said, basically, you and Sasha rolled your D20s and you wound up dead for what you believed it was right. Is he kind of right? I mean, is sac- uh, self-sacrifice so season seven? <laughs> oh, my God. That's a good quote. Listen, you know, you make your choice. You make your bed. You're going to have to sleep with it. You cook your lunch. You got to eat it. These people made their decisions, you know, like if Sasha hadn't decided to go on her mad spree running into the sanctuary, she wouldn't have got captured. She might still be with us. But, you know, Star Trek Discovery needed to happen, I guess, even though you have to have a special subscription to go watch it. I'm not paying for that, guys. I'll find another way. Same thing with Eugene. He made his decision and now he's living the high life. And same thing with Father Gabriel. Like if he would have just let Gregory die. He'd be back with everybody else, wouldn't have to cover himself with guts, and he'd be just doing just fine right now. But, you know, we all make our decisions. Daryl forces their hands because they're basically trapped in the upper levels now, but they do have a lot of firepower. So I guess there's one way out, and they're going to shoot it out. Eugene goes to Negan and basically says, I can fix this. I have an idea. And if we use the bullets to get out of here, I'll make more for you. I mean, at this moment... I've never felt more wrong about Eugene, you know, and sometimes I just I don't get this stuff right. Sometimes, you know, I, I want to believe that there's there's good in characters because I like them. And, you know, I like the fact that he constantly references 80s and 90s pop culture and Dungeons and Dragons and stuff. Were you a little disappointed when, it, you know, when it basically comes down to it, that now that the saviors are free or it looks like they're going to get free, that Eugene basically gave them the go ahead. Eugene is the emphasis behind. I mean, listen, we're going into the finale next week and people are going to die. 
the bottom line, we're going to lose some characters. There's going to be some empty seats at Walker Stalker going on. We're going to lose some people. But and that's all Eugene. Are you starting to question whether he actually is playing a role or he's he believes that he's Negan? I'm not starting to question it, honestly, at this point. I'm still still team Eugene. I'm still believing it. That whole thing was to keep himself and the innocent people of the sanctuary alive. You can't just throw them to the wolves or the walkers at this point. You can't just let them all die. You got to do something. And and you still, remember, Eugene was told, you find a way out of this or I'm going to kill you myself from Negan. You got to do something. That doesn't mean he can't, like you said, can you make me more bullets? Yeah, maybe he makes them a bunch of fucked up bullets. There's all kinds of ways you can subvert this later. Yeah, but the jig is up the second that they start firing these bullets and guns start malfunctioning. And, and you know, he's not going to leave his fingerprints on anything. So there's got to be an honest reason, you know, that he's got to lay the groundwork for, you know, this is a no fault uh, sabotage where Dwight isn't as smart. So it's a little more direct. I, you know, I'm going to conveniently have red paint on my hands and touch the bag. And, you know, uh, Eugene's, if he's going to do this, he's not going to, he's not going to leave fingerprints on it. So if he he makes some screwed up bullets, I just, you know, we're going to know directly who to blame. You know, if he could somehow make every single gun explode in every single savior's hand at the same time, I think he's all for that, but I don't know. Oh shit, Ig, look, Winston 2.0. And Winston 2.0 is going to make House Party 1 look like House Party 2 or 3. <laughs> Man, shut the hell up. <laughs> you know, if they can do anything over at, over at the trash heap, they can weaponize some fucking walkers. They, you know, you got to have a skill, and that is their skill. Look, we can, we can turn the good the bad into good. We can put some awesome helmets on these guys so you can't just shoot them in the noggin and then you're off with them. They can still keep coming at you. They And they look awesome. You know, Winston 2.0 doesn't look as awesome as Winston 1.0. But he's still effective. He's pretty awesome. And I, I I, saw that come out and I was like, another one. These guys are fucking awesome. That's the one thing I absolutely love about the Heapsters is that they, they have weaponized walkers and it just fucking marks me out every time. Is this the natural progression of body art, though? I mean, uh, are we going to see, you know, big hoops in zombies ears and, you know, uh, big, big plates in their lips and uh, i mean I, I i don't know it just didn't have the impact for me as the first one uh, rick takes them out and nothing but his drawers he takes out all three of them he gets jadis to relent and switch sides did you feel winston 2.0 didn't just have the teeth that classic winston did well he'd already gone up against one so he knew kind of what to expect a little bit you know you've you've been through that battle already and this one the the, the spikes coming out of the helmet were cool looking but they weren't quite as imposing as Winston 1.0. You know, the other ones were sticking straight out. These ones are kind of sticking down and forward. It a little bit easier to circumvent. How good is somebody's word, IG? I mean, when it's when you have to get it by force, uh, by threat, by, uh, by gunpoint, by walker bite, how much can you believe somebody when I can't just get a handshake and a nod from you, but I've got to threaten violence against you to get you to join, you know, Team Cynic? Well, that's the problem is that when when you get agreement under duress how much can you really trust it i i don't think that this is a a good situation for our heroes that we're trying to get the heapsters back on board i'm holding out hope that it works um because i think we've had some recent losses and i think we've had some problems going on for the for the heroes in the past couple of weeks I'd like to see some wins come back. I don't think it's going to happen in the midseason finale. I think they're going to get their ass handed to them, and I think there's going to be some bigger problems. But I'd like for the Heapsters to actually get on board and help in some way to see the error of the Sanctuary and the Saviors and decide that, you know, if we like to keep our garbage pail spot, that we're going to have to do something to keep those guys out of it. Rick and the Heapsters return to find the snipers dead. The savior's gone. What were your thoughts on the episode, your rating, and the shitstorm that's most definitely headed towards Alexandria? I liked the episode. Uh, This is the first one in a while that I really kind of got behind. Maybe it's because I really like Eugene. I like his speech cadence. I like the things that he says. I like the references. There was a lot of things going on and there was movement. And, you know, we've seen that now the sanctuary is basically out of the Walker infestation. That being said, there's a lot of things coming, and I'm a little scared on who's going to make it through the midseason finale. I think, you know, the death pool is going to really start to even out here real sudden-like. I'm still winning. You are still winning. 
Um, I don't know. I, I think that we're going to have a really interesting midseason finale and it's going to cliffhang us really hard. So we're going to get a lot of people wanting to come back into the second half. I, I think this episode is a strong seven and a half. It's still not great. There's still plenty of problems with it. Still some plot armor. I think Daryl probably should have died trying to drive that truck in there. Yeah, that was a little weird. I mean, he did that whole thing and then just walked away casually. N- nobody seeing nothing. Not one walker turned their head and, and you know, tried to stop him from running off. He didn't even have to stab one. Didn't have to do anything, you know, and then you've got Tara back shooting repeatedly with an automatic weapon and not one walker turns around. I just I some of the things seemed a little plot armor thick and that's OK for The Walking Dead. They do that quite a bit. I, I'm OK with it. I, I enjoyed it. I liked it. 7.5. And I think we got a big, big, big midseason finale coming. I think it's going to be amazing. I personally like Time for After, but it also cemented the whole fall from grace for Eugene for me. I fought so hard not to believe it, but I'll admit it. Sometimes I'm just flat out wrong. I enjoyed the Rick scenes, even though I really didn't fully understand them, or I still don't trust the heapsters. I wasn't a fan of the Daryl or Tara vendetta parts, though. I, they just didn't make any sense to me. I'm not sure how the fandom is going to react to this this episode, because They've had it up to their eyebrows with haircut. The, you know, everybody I talked to about Eugene hates the guy, and we're gonna we're gonna spend most of the episode talking about his morality and whether he's doing the right thing or he's acting in self interest. And I'm not sure how people are gonna react to that. So we give them a, a double dose of Eugene sandwiched between two very convoluted plans. I give the episode a seven, and I pray for a strong mid season finale. I warn you all: the saviors are coming, and when they get there, it's not gonna be pretty. And that's going to do it for this episode of The Walking Dead Underground. I'm Igrahi. With me has been my good friend and co-host, Cynic. We're going to give this episode of The Walking Dead, Season 8, Episode 7, Time for After, a 7.25. It's a pretty good episode. A lot of things going on, and it's very strong with the haircut. We love us some haircut here at the Cynic Radio Podcast and the Walking Dead Underground. So we want you to send us your favorite haircut picks. You seen some outlandish stuff in your life? Send them to us. And you can send it right now at cynicradio at gmail.com. You can find us on the internet at cynicradio.com. Look for us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cynicradio. And find us on Twitter at cynicradio. Also on Facebook, go and look for the Walking Dead Underground. That's a great fan site with more than 20,000 members. A lot of fun. The best Walking Dead memes on the internet. We want to send out another special thanks to Carl McKeenan. That was a great interview, sir, and we can't wait to talk to you again and see the next thing you show up in. Also, it's not too late for this holiday season. Head on over to tpublic.com and get yourself some Walking Dead Underground or Cynic Radio Podcast gear. Hats, t-shirts, coffee cups, mugs, bags, all kinds of great stuff. Go get it because you know you want it. And if you don't, a loved one probably does. We love every one of you and hope you're having a great holiday season. Keep coming back each and every week. We've got one more episode of The Walking Dead till the mid-season break. We've got another exciting interview coming next week. We can't wait to share it with you. Come back. You'll have to come back to listen to it. Like, listen, subscribe, and share this with all your friends. And until next time, don't get captured. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and at thewalkingdeadunderground.com. Join us in our fight against the saviors. Uh-huh. Cynic Radio says all you Gene haters out there, sit down. I don't care if he is a savior right now. I love me some haircut. Hashtag respect the mullet.